sahanavavatu sahano bunaktu sahavir yang karavavahai tejasvina vaditamastu ma vidvishavahai om shanti 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 Om, may the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace. Peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, welcome back everyone and namaste as we resume our study of Swami Ranganathananda's talk, Divine Grace, published as a book that we're studying. But before we go ahead, I would like to take note of the fact that one of our dear comrades, colleagues and friends, Tom Couch, left the body on Tuesday, August 30th at about 7 a.m. in the ICU of Piedmont Hospital the proximate cause of his leaving the body was bacterial pneumonia. There was a lot more to it. I won't go into it. If you want to read about it, it's in last week's newsletter. And uh, there will be, it's on the Facebook page and also on the Facebook page, you can find access to it there as well. So please uh, do, uh, do if you are wondering to know more about how Tom left us, he was a leader of this place for well over 30 years, one of Swami Yogeshananda's earlier disciples and one of the early leaders of this place, along with Pranab Lahiri, uh, Bhagirat and Uma Majmadar and, and others. Uh, so I'd like to ask us to observe a moment of silence uh, in Tom's memory, and uh, you might just hold a sweet thought for Tom and for his wife of 24 years, Iris Couch and their family, as, uh, as we join them in their grief. So just a few moments of silence. Hmm. Jai Jai, the Divine Spirit, as it appears in each and every one of us, including beloved Tom Couch. So, um, before we proceed with our reading, uh, in thinking about this book uh, and what we've read and discussed so far, is there anything that needs to be asked or said or commented on before we ask Swayam to take up the reading. All right, dears. If there's nothing, then I'll ask Swayam to read uh, the page number again, uh, 
It's 26, and we are going to start with uh, number 17. Okay, which is titled Divine Grace. Right. Okay, please go ahead, dear. Okay. Divine Grace. It's presence behind self-reliance and self-surrender. So, in the light of this great philosophy, the Gita deals with human life in its wholeness. You start as a man dealing with the world outside. You are not seeing God yet. You will be a man among men, interacting with them in the social context and developing manliness and character strength in the process. Then, slowly, in and through that interaction, and with the aid of discrimination and love of truth, you will rise to the higher level. Okay, please note, then slowly, and we must really be aware and keep in mind that it is a slow process. Swami Sri Dharananda reminds us again and again, slowly and slowly, my dear. We are, after all, eons old as beings who have taken form. So then slowly and through that interaction, playing the game of life successfully and with the aid of discrimination, and love of truth. Notice these two qualifications. These are qualifications for the spiritual aspirant. Discrimination, trying to discern what is real and what is illusory for the dream. So with the aid of discrimination and love of truth, you will rise to the higher level. So this is, we learn to play the game of life successfully. Then something else begins to dawn in us slowly and slowly. And with the aid of discrimination and love of truth, you will rise to the higher level. Any comments or questions about any of that? All right, Swayam, please go ahead. When the mind becomes pure and strong, it will gradually feel the touch of something purer, deeper, some imitations of divine Inti pulsation. Some intimations, some intimations. Oh. Some intimations of the divine pulsations from within. Let me read that again. When the mind becomes pure, pure and strong, it will gradually feel the touch of something purer, deeper, some intimations of the divine pulsations from within. Notice the word pulsations. This is a realm, this universe is a realm of vibration. And so when the Swami uses the word pulsations, he spoke in English. This is not a translation from some other language. He was speaking to Australians and in English. So pulsations is very deliberate. It is these pulsations of a higher level that transform us, literally transform our bodies, our body-mind complex, our antakarna, and uh, which is the body-mind complex, that's the Sanskrit term, and our chitta, <clears throat> our mind stuff, which is all of the nervous systems, both gross and subtle, that exist within us. That's the chitta, the mind stuff. Slowly and slowly, this purity, this higher, deeper, pure pulsations from within, where do they come from? They come from the Atman. They come from the divine presence that is eternally within us and the source of our being. So anything about any of that? Anything that needs uh, any further explanation or amplification? 
Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, I also um, like, or I, I know that's the right word, but the way it's, uh, he's described that um, feel the touch, gradually feel the touch of something purer or deeper. Yes. Not something from grasping from the mind, but feeling uh, with the heart. Yes, that's exactly it. And this is why Swami Prabhavananda's first instruction for meditation is feel that living presence. Not, not anything else, not know it in an intellectual sense. No, feel that living presence. And as you feel that living presence, you know the transformation is ongoing. Thank you, Swayam. Anything else from anyone? Okay, dear, please. Only a strong mind can receive it, understand it, and respond to it. Only an elephant can understand the strength of a lion, Vivekananda said, but not a mosquito. <laughs> no. <laughs> A mosquito will not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a mosquito will not understand the strength of a lion. Um, it is not our organically limited ego that is our true form. Behind the ego and beyond all <clears throat> organic limitations is the infinite Atman. That is the self of our self the one self in all infinite and non-dual well, please read that again dear please read this is this is the when we begin to be aware of what he's saying in this feeling of it this is divine grace that's why this little subsection is called divine grace so please read that again it is not our organically limited ego that is our true form. Behind the ego and beyond all organic limitations is the infinite Atman. That is the self of our self and the one self in all, infinite and non-dual. Consciousness is primary and is not plural. Consciousness is primary. Consciousness, the Atman, is primary and is not plural. This is the way Swami Yogeshananda taught it. In this simple English formula, consciousness is primary. Nothing comes before the causeless cause of consciousness. Consciousness is primary and is not plural, which is a very nice way of saying non-dual. Anything about this particular paragraph? I'm pausing because each the, he's now giving us the definition of the title of this book. This section is called Divine Grace. And the eight Oh, the eight. Seventeen adds to eight. Eight is the number for the removing of obstacles to our understanding. So he is giving us the information that can remove the obstacles to our understanding and our uh, ability to discriminate between the limited body-mind complex and the truth behind it, as he says. Anything from anyone? All right, dear, please read on. In complete human unfoldment, this ego surrenders completely to that self. Sings the great Advaita philosopher Shankaracharya in his Vishnu Sat Satpadi. And I'm going to skip that Sanskrit part. Yes, please. When the sense of separateness, 
between me and thee is removed, that is, Samadhi, it is I who merge in thee, O Lord, and not thou in me. Verily, the wave merges in the ocean, and not the ocean in the wave. Adi Shankar Acharya said of his time of realization, my mind fell like an my mind fell like a hailstone into the ocean of consciousness and therein dissolved. My mind fell like a hailstone into the ocean of consciousness and therein dissolved. So read, read that, uh, that verse again, dear, mm -hmm. from when the sense. Okay. When the sense of separateness between me and thee is removed in samadhi it is i who merge in thee o lord and not thou in me verily the wave merges in the ocean and not the ocean in the wave it is that inner self of all that speaks through the divine incarnation as shri krishna in that verse 66, chapter 18 of the Gita, abandoning all dharmas, take refuge in me alone. I will liberate you from all sins. Grieve not. This no, is- Wait, wait, wait. Abandoning all dharmas. Hmm? Abandoning all those things that are actions, thoughts, perceptions all those things so you've gone beyond purity to the abandonment of self-surrender it is that inner self and all that speaks through the divine incarnation that sri krishna in that verse 66 of chapter 18 of the gita abandoning all dharmas take refuge in me alone the atman i will liberate you from all sins all your karmas i will liberate you from all your karmas grieve not now this is this is the again it's a restatement you know, the, the Swami is going through and stating it in a number of different ways. This is the divine grace in action. So any comment or question, anything at all that comes to your mind that uh, from your own experience illuminates this or any concern or question that it raises in your mind. Um, Brother Shankara. Yes, dear. I was thinking that we do have small moments of surrender off and on throughout our lives. Um, you know, there are times when we have done everything and then we sort of, I guess, surrender. And at night, every night when we go to bed, we do surrender. It's just not we are doing it consciously, I guess. Ah, uh, yes, exactly. As we as we go into the land of Nod, or sleep, we are indeed surrendering, and we first surrender to uh, all the samskaras that are in our minds, that represent themselves as our dreams. The latent and the active samskaras come to us as dreams, and they're meant to be instructive. They're meant to uh, help us review what is in our mind because most people, you know, the same thing will happen as you practice contemplation, concentration, and meditation. You will have access to that same state, that, that uh, dream state. And then we get the great gift, the great grace of the dreamless sleep state where awareness consciousness is there but we're not aware of it so there's no disturbance in the mind 
if you see the studies done on the brain waves of dreamless sleep. It is a great uh, long wave of rest and refuge. And it's because at that time, we are the closest to the causeless cause within us, the, the Atman, that little blue being the size of a thumb that lives in the heart. Uh, we, are, we are near, but, and this is when we come to this uh, in meditation, this is Samadhi. But the difference is now we have awareness of what it is that we're witnessing. That's Sabikalpa Samadhi. Any comments or questions? Okay, notice that the, again, these great promises by the incarnations, they're the only ones, them and their saints, they are the only ones qualified to say this. Take refuge in me alone. I, I, who is this I? The divine being itself. I will liberate you from all sins. I will free you from your karma. You will no longer be required to return to this life as an embodied being. Grieve not and fear not. You see why this is such a powerful, powerful book. Because the Swami is now helping us remove all the obstacles, one by one by one. He's just saying, it's this, it's this. Here's a way to understand it. Here's a way to understand it. Here's a way to understand it. Here's a way to feel it in your heart. Okay, dear. The Supreme Lord is ever present in the heart space of all beings, Arjuna. Wait a, wait a minute, isn't there something? This is this oh. is preached. This is prefaced. So after the abandoning all dharmas, take refuge in me alone. I will liberate you from all sins. Grieve not. And that's in verse 66, chapter 18. And Swami says, this is prefaced by an earlier statement in verse 61. The Supreme Lord is ever present in the heart space of all beings, Arjuna. The Lord, the infinite source of all truth, beauty and goodness, means to tell everyone through Arjuna, in the hearts of all beings, behind that ego of theirs, I'm always there. I don't want to interfere with all these beings earlier because I want their egos to be, to be developed first. But I stand behind watching. And I know that when any devotee becomes strong by exercising his or her ego and its powers, at a particular point of his or her spiritual development, he or she will certainly turn to me and find in me their highest and best. Then will come self-surrender naturally and spontaneously. So in that verse, Sri Krishna says, um, the Lord, is in the hearts of all beings. Ishwara, the Lord. Ishwara, Ishwara, the Lord. Ishwara is the divine being within manifestation, between, but within time, space, and causation. The master of the gunas and the creator, sustainer, and transformer of all reality for all of us. So the Lord is in the hearts of all beings. Okay, dear. He knows everything which all beings are doing. All beings may not know this truth about him, but he knows it. In the last verse of the fifth chapter of the Gita, he had said, knowing me as the 
enjoyer of all sacrifices and austerities done by beings, as the great Lord of all the worlds, and most intimately as the friend of all beings, man attains peace. Notice as the friend of all beings. This is something that Sri Ramakrishna emphasizes all over and over. The Lord is your friend. The Lord is your friend. Just find a way to develop that relationship. Just find a way to be in relationship. And Sri Krishna in chapter five tells you how to do it. He says, live sacramentally, offer everything to me, keep me in mind. Each and everything that you do, think, feel, uh, all everything within the day, the night, offer it all to me and slowly and slowly you will see that your great friend is accepting these things and not only accepting them, but holding you very dear, which is what Krishna says. Okay, anything at all? A um, couple of things. Uh, one is, um, I was thinking that whether we obviously to get to the Advaita is very difficult. Until then, even as a Dvaita, if we think that, um, you know, the Lord is doing everything, I mean, He um, he's obviously doing everything so um i'm trying to find ways to express what's in me uh, so whatever happens we we should uh, not should i mean we it, it would be us to accept that i mean he's doing it we just don't have, see have that faith yes have that faith in the scripture Right. And he has a right to do this. I mean, if I was powerful, I would want to do different things. You know? yes. So I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but. And this business about Advoita, yeah. we, can, we can say the word Advoita. We can think about Advoita. We can gesture toward Advoita. But we will not know Advoita until we have achieved Savikalpa Samadhi, this, this full vision of the divine presence within us, within us, in our hearts. Fill this heart. So you, you have this. Then, as Swami Prabhupada said, then we can talk about nirvikalpa samadhi. Then, the, but it isn't something that can be known, because when we are in that state of realization of Brahman, the knower is left behind. As Adi Shankaracharya said, his mind dissolved in the ocean of consciousness. There was no mind left. Now, by the grace of the divinity, Adi Shankaracharya and these other great incarnations of the divine, they return, keeping, as Sri Ramakrishna puts it, this slender thread of the ego of wisdom or of love or both. And so it is from this that they speak and teach. And so this is, uh, and you said behoove. That's a very good word. Th that which we are, that which is auspicious for us, behooves us. We should move in that direction. To be auspicious, not, not because we should, because it's dogma, but because it is auspicious for us, we move in that direction. And until we genuinely feel it, we won't do it. 
we will cling to our attachments and to our sense of the body-mind complex as the reality and the rest of this as an idea. Uh, we get the dream of body-mind complex confused with what seems to us to be this dream of spiritual uh, attainment. No, it is the body-mind complex that is the dream. Uh, and it is the reality is what is being described to us by the Swami here. Notice how long a section this is. Many of these sections were quite short. This one is long because he is trying to give us as many removers of obstacles, ways of us understanding as he can. <clears throat> Anything else, Swayam, or anyone else? Um, yes, Brother Shankara, I do have another request. Can we do a little manana on this particular um, sentence or two? Um, yes. Um, when any devotee becomes strong by exercising his or her ego and its powers at a particular point of his or her spiritual development, he or she will certainly turn to me and find in me their highest and best. Um, the, it's the last part that I am having a uh, little difficulty um, grasping. What does he mean when he says, find in me their highest and best? They will find that intimations of the reality of the Atman. They'll begin to sense it. They'll, something will happen to them. I have heard this so many times from, uh, you know, over the 12 years I've been here in talking to devotees, people who become devotees, they say something happened to me. I had this, you know, I was just going along through my life and something happened to me. I, I became aware there's something more. I felt it. I knew it. I didn't know what to make of it. And they say in one way or another, they say, that's why I'm here to try to understand what to make of it. And certainly uh, this is, if we look back at ourselves, you know, fifty years ago, nineteen seventy three, the eternal teacher glanced at me. Not a word was said, my eyes filled with tears. He's awakened me still after all these years. His heart is afire because he is free. His clear eyes show what it is to see beyond the pages of any book and know the truth wherever he looks. At some point, we will be touched by that eternal teacher. And we have to beware of doing what Winston Churchill, you know, he, Churchill was an Asura, but he's our Asura. And he had some wisdom. And one of the things he said was, many people stumble over the truth and then get up and walk on as if nothing had happened. We must not do that. We must be alert and aware. It isn't that the, the glance won't come again, the touch won't come again, it will. But the sooner uh, it's auspicious for us to be up and doing, to, to get with it. So that is what he's speaking of, dear. And it happened to you, that's why, you know, you told me that one morning you came here for a talk and you'd been poking around here and there, you came here for a talk and the, the words, what deserves my attention, really caught your attention. And so there it was, the eternal teacher saying, what deserves your attention? It happened to you. And so it wasn't very long after that, that you sought out Swami Sarvadevananda flying clear across the country and took diksha, took initiation. Because you said, 
ah, I have a sense of what it is that deserves my attention. How do I go about applying my attention? And you had the grace and the wisdom. The divine grace came to you and gave you the wisdom. Ah, this, this, this man who is guru, remover of darkness, he can give me instructions. And so he did. And I'm not saying to any of you that you should take initiation. I'm just saying, <clears throat> if this feeling comes on you, it is available to you. And you can, you can go to Swami Sarvadevananda on the West Coast and take initiation there because it probably won't be till the end of the year that he's back here. Or you can do as others have done. Uh, 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 go to Swami Chetanananda in St. Louis, which is the closest center in that direction, or to Swami Yogatmananda, a bit further away. Others have done that. So a, a Diksha initiation, spiritual initiation, is available to you if that touch comes to you and you feel so moved. And uh, if, they, if you uh, want to know more about that, all you have to do is call me up and talk to me about it. So it happened to you, Soil. It isn't, it isn't really a mystery at all. Thank you, Benjamin. Anything else from anyone about this? How are we doing for time? Okay, we've got some time left. Good. All right, dear, please read on. Um, I will repeat that Gita verse. Please. Knowing me as the enjoyer of all sacrifices and austerities done by beings, as the great Lord of all the worlds, and most intimately as the friend of all beings, man attains peace. But not knowing this truth, man often feels helpless, peaceless, and grief-stricken. God is in all men, but all men are not in God. Therefore, man suffers, says Sri Ramakrishna. The subject of man's search for the divine and God's response to man is beautifully presented in its imagery of the two birds by the Mundaka Upanishad. Two birds of beautiful plumage, always together, friends of each other, live on the self same tree. One of them eats the sweet and bitter fruits of the tree, while the other, without eating the fruits, sits immersed in its own glory. On the self-same tree of life is man immersed, and deluded and feeling helpless, he grieves. But when he sees the other, the adorable and the sovereign and the free, he discards his grief, realizing himself as but his glory. Introducing these verses. Now, wait a minute. Let's not let's not pass that by. What is it that you, what you realize? You realize yourself as but His glory, and, and it's explained that what the the bird at, on the lower limbs, the one eating the bitter and the sweet fruits, realizes that he is but the shadow of this glorious bird, and. In that glory, then, he takes refuge and discriminates against eating the bitter and sweet fruits. Because this is, this is transitory. This comes and goes. But, so there should be no attachment to it. But the other, the one that is immersed in his own glory. Hmm? That is eternal, infinite, changeless. So we 
most auspiciously attach ourselves to that. Okay, dear. Um, Brother Shankar, just um, a quick um, comment, like I was doing some manana. Um, so when we think of um, the Paramatma as the infinite existence, consciousness and bliss, infinite is not something that can ever sort of be contained. Um, and, and in that regard, I mean, the, that is experiencing through us um, every little bit of its infiniteness and its existence and bliss. Precisely. That's as Krishna explains in the Gita. The Atman has created these beings for its own reasons, with its own intentions and experiences our experiences thereby sanctioning them in other words there's nothing wrong with being creating doing and sharing what's what could possibly be wrong is becoming attached mm. to any particular pattern mm. any particular substance any particular being, any particular creating, doing or sharing. So we, we, you know, that being, creating, doing, sharing, that's just a summary of, of what we're up to. Well, as Sri Krishna points out in the Gita, the Atman is, has done this very deliberately. Hmm? I am one, I shall body myself forth as many in order to experience, as you just said, that manyness. Swami Sarvabhim Priyananda was asked, well, why did it do that? And Sarva Priyananda said, the answer, you know, is very American, because it can. And there is no other answer. That's what he was pointing out. Mm -hmm. There's no possible way for us to understand the thoughts, the actions of the causeless cause. Mm -hmm. There's no way for us, no way for us to understand the infinite. We can realize that infinite or absolute existence, knowledge, and bliss. But when we come back from that state, if we come back to embodiment from that state, we will not be able to say what happened because the knower and the sayer was left behind. It was dissolved when you became immersed in that ocean of consciousness. Thank you, Swayam, for bringing all these things up. It's, this, is, this is wonderful. On that note, one time Swami Yogeshananda explained to me why I asked him, why does God do the things he does? He said, Brahmadas, you're breaking up. Pretty good analogy. We're not, we, we, we missed your words. I, okay. I, we yeah, missed what he my did. Router here. So, so he said to me, well, that would be like a dog trying to understand why a human does the things he does. It's just, you know, we can't possibly understand it. I thought that was a pretty good analogy. It, 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 it is a good analogy, but it, it's perhaps uh, even more primitive than that. It would be like... Uh, an ant or a, or a lizard trying to understand what, uh, what uh, you know, all of these forms are simply limitations of consciousness. And uh, so our human form is a limitation of consciousness, very deliberate as was just discussed, so that all of this can be experienced as a duality. Hmm? 
And this is why we must not be attached to either those things that we like or those things we dislike. And it's very hard. It is a struggle. This is why we need the spiritual practices. This is why we need to study these books and these Gitas, I mean the Gita and the four yogas and so on, so that we get the tools that allow us to practice discrimination and to practice discrimination, to practice discrimination and renunciation, I mean, to, to renounce those things that are simply holding us back. But Swami Prabhupada said, and we'll see that uh, Ranganathananda says the same thing. In other words, don't worry so much about what's limiting you. What deserves your attention is the unlimited. And so do your best. It's most auspicious for you to do your best to focus your attention there and use your spiritual practices to recollect and recollect and recollect. And all of the spiritual teachers and spiritual practices uh, give us these tools for bringing the mind under control. Yeah. Anything else from anyone? All right, dear, please read on. Introducing these verses, which is the above two verses, in the verbs, where can you find a more perfect expression of the whole philosophy of the world? The gist of what the Hindus ever thought, the whole dream of human salvation, painted in language more wonderful, figure more marvelous than this. Swami Vivekananda says, in his lecture on Vedanta and its application to Indian life in the complete works, this is the picture of the human soul. Man is eating the sweet and bitter fruits of this life, pursuing gold, pursuing his senses, pursuing the vanities of life, hopelessly, madly, Careering he goes, Career. careering he goes. In other places, the Upanishads have compared the human soul to the charioteer and the senses to the mad horses unrestrained. Such is the career of men pursuing the vanities of life, children dreaming golden dreams only to find that they are but vain, and old men chewing the cud of their past deeds, and yet not knowing how to get out of this network. This is the world. Yet, in the life of everyone, there come golden moments in the midst of the deepest sorrows, nay, of the deepest joys. There come moments when a part of the cloud that hides the sunlight moves away as it were and we catch a glimpse in spite of ourselves of something beyond away away beyond the life of the senses away away beyond its vanities its joys and its sorrows away away beyond nature or our imaginations of happiness here or hereafter away beyond all thirst for gold or for fame or for name or for posterity. Man stops for a moment at this glimpse and sees the other bird, calm and majestic, eating neither sweet nor bitter fruits, but immersed in his own glory, self-content, self-satisfied. As the Gita says, he whose devotion is to the Atman, he who does not want anything beyond the Atman, he who has become satisfied in the Atman, what work is there for him to do? Why should he drudge? 
man catches a glimpse, then again forgets and goes on eating the sweet and bitter fruits of life. Perhaps after a time, he catches another glimpse and the lower bird goes nearer and nearer to the higher bird as blows after blows are received. If he be fortunate to receive hard knocks, then he comes nearer and nearer to his companion, the other bird, his life, his friend. And as he approaches him, he finds that the light from the higher bird is playing around his own plumage. And as he comes nearer and nearer, lo, the transformation is going on. The nearer and nearer he comes, he finds himself melting away, as it were, until he has entirely disappeared. He did not really exist. It was but the reflection of the other bird who was there calm and majestic amidst the moving leaves. It was all his glory, that upper bird's. He then becomes fearless, perfectly satisfied, perfectly satisfied, calmly serene. And that's the um, end of Swami Vivekananda's words in that lecture. Yes. Anything at all from anyone about what has been read before we go on? Okay, dear. Um, Brother Shankar, I do have a question. Yes, dear. Um, it's, he says, uh, Swamiji says, yet, in the life of everyone, there come golden moments in the midst of the deepest sorrows, nay, of the deepest joys. There come moments when a part of the cloud, etc., etc. So what is the, the meaning of the nay over there? Does he mean that in the midst of sorrows and not the deepest joys? No, 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 no. Or... No, he means, he means in addition. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, uh, that that's the way Swami uses the word nay. Okay. It's a Victorian use of the word nay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the English that uh, Swamiji was trained in, and that he spoke. Uh, it uh, it changed a bit as he came and taught in America, uh, but. Uh, uh, that was the that was the English that he spoke when he when he came here in 1893. <clears throat> so, no, he means in both situations. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Anything else from anyone? It is so interesting because whatever the Swamiji is talking about is the ego, which is a shadow of the Atma. Yes. But the shadow, it is, you know, you cannot catch it and it is disappearing so fast. Right. Exactly, Balaji. You cannot catch it. <laughs> the more... This is what Ramana Maharshi keeps telling us. The more you try to find out what the ego is, this I that you think you are is, the more elusive it becomes. And finally you say, it, it doesn't exist. It's, it's not a reality. Uh, it, it, there's a beautiful line in, in a Bob Dylan song. I've grown so tired of chasing lies. I've grown so tired of chasing lies. It's, it, it just isn't there. It just, it is, as you say, the shadow. But it is intentionally cast by the Atman. The Atman is shining in its own glory and casts this shadow for its own purposes. And as, as Krishna says in the Gita, it intends to do it. It has its own purposes for doing it. And it experiences what 
we experience, the, the embodied being, the jiva, it experiences what we experience, as well as all of all other, all else of creation. But somehow we are said to be special to the Atman. It experiences what we experience and thereby sanctions our experiences. So there's no reason for us to feel uh, like we shouldn't have these experiences. As Sri Ramakrishna said, you've come to the mango grove, eat the mangoes. <laughs> the more you, the more you uh, contemplate concentrate and meditate on that particular statement of Sri Ramakrishna, the more relieved you become. I guarantee it. Just, just practice some contemplation, concentration, and meditation on the statement of Sri Ramakrishna. You have come to the mango grove. Eat the mangoes. And then he goes on to say, but don't count the mango trees. Don't count the limbs on the trees, the number of mangoes on the trees, the number of twigs, the number of leaves. Don't fuss about all that. Just eat the mangoes. Such Come a great... Uh, and merge yourself into mango-ness. <laughs> Very nicely put, Jeff. Merge yourself into mango-ness. Yes. Yes. What is it to be mangoes? What is it to, to, to eat the mangoes? What is it to be, be one with the mangoness? So it's 826. Thank you, Jeff. Is there anything more from you? Um, Not from me, no. Okay, Ms. Um, I was going to uh, share something about um, a friend that uh, not to judge this person, but just to bring out this chasing uh, life. Yes. Uh, because I was contemplating on that. So this person is um, somewhere like around 67 or 68 years old and has had a very successful career as a university professor, researcher, and raised three children, very successful, all are physicians and, um, you know, uh, pretty much done his responsibilities and also his help his sisters and brothers and everything. Um, he continues to work, which is he has a joy in his work. But in, on top of that, he has bought this business because his uh, he says that he wants to build a school in the village where he grew up to make his father proud of him. Uh, and so that's the reason why he's doing this, but he seems not very, um, what should I say, content doing this. He's having a lot of emotional, and he's angry, his uh, family is not happy, but he's not able to come to some point in his life where he can still do it, but as an offering rather than uh, a, a compulsion, you know, to make his father proud or whatever. So that was my feeling. I mean, I was trying to think. Uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, um, it seems like a great uh, karma, you know, karma he's doing, but um, where is um, that leading, you know? I, I don't know. It's, 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 it it's, goes back to what deserves your attention, dear. Sri Ramakrishna said, does God need you to build another school? No, make your first priority, finding God. Finding God. This is obviously a very capable and successful and intelligent person. But he's been ignoring these glimpses that came to him and is still focused on the fact that he's that his father uh, has this uh, ego game that he's playing with him of I'm not proud of you. No matter what you've done, I'm not proud. You're, you're still not enough. It's one of the terrible things that some parents do. They just, it's, it's truly cruel. But it is this man's karma. So if he would get it through his head, what Sri Ramakrishna said, you know, Make your first priority the knowledge of God. 
Then you'll know what to do. God will tell you what to do. If it's build a school, fine. Mm -hmm. But as, as <laughs> Jesus could not have put it more succinctly for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom is where the king lives. The king is the Atman. It is the, the, that which creates and does everything, is responsible for everything. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added unto you, all wisdom and all righteousness. So no, not at all judge this person, uh, 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 Swayon. Uh, pray for this person. Pray that they will, that they will, the next time that the divine being gives them a glimpse, as, as Ranganathananda puts it, next time that a glimpse comes, that that person will say, oh, enough of this worldly pursuit, enough of these ego games with authorities, parental and otherwise, enough struggling. I'm going to pass away soon, you know, 20 years from now, whatever it is, that's soon. You know, uh, I'm going to pass away. So let me find the source of true happiness, which will is not his father's pride in him, not building a school. I mean, all, all those things are so low order by comparison with what that great mind he has, that great spirit he has, is capable of. So pray for him. Pray for him. Just, and, and you don't have to pray for anything specific. Just say, Lord, whatever is auspicious for this man, please bring it to his attention. And, and, that's all we can do. Just give him, give him wisdom, give him grace, give him peace. Very good example, Smile. Very good example. Anything else from anyone, dears? Okay, it's three minutes after the half hour. If there isn't anything else, then we will close. And we'll close with this prayer. O oh Lord, take my hand. O oh Lord, pull me on. O oh Lord, draw me near. Seat me by thy fire. <coughs> o oh Lord, take my hand. Without thee I may fall. O Lord, pull me on. Without thee I may stray. O Lord, draw me near. Seat me by thy fire. Keep me there till all darkness is gone. O Lord, fill this heart. O Lord, fill this heart. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee I may fall. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. I think Shankara's uh, TV thing is froze, internet.
Brother Shagra, can you hear us? Looks like he logged off too. Yeah, that's right. I think the internet goes. Namaste, everybody. Namaste. See you Saturday morning. Take care. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.